Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo. As you might have noticed, the podcast temporarily disappeared for a couple of weeks because like all of you listening, when we went into lockdown, it took a while to get used to this new normal. But we're back now and sharing another great story and actually a solution as well. Before I get on with this episode, I wanted to share a couple of my own thoughts on this new world that we live in and how that will impact on journey skills, or at least how I think it'll impact on journey skills in the long run. I don't know your individual circumstances, but as a parent of a young person with additional needs, there are some unique challenges that we all face. But we are finally getting into a new weekly routine. And if you haven't found PE with Joe Wicks on YouTube, I can thoroughly recommend that as one way to start your day. So we are in a routine and actually from a work point of view, this has given me a lot of time to think about the bigger picture in terms of what Journey Skills was started for. And as you probably already know, three things that Journey Skills is all about, which is relationships, work and daily living. And we want to look at how we can join all those things together and help people create a way that we can all move forward and help our young people become independent. So personally, it's been good for me in the sense that I've been able to spend some time thinking about how that might be achieved. One of the things I've noticed here in the UK, at least, has been this growing sense of community. So I'm kind of hopeful that that's going to make a difference in the way that people maybe see the world. Of course, the economic impact of this pandemic is going to be pretty major, and I suspect will affect many of the charities that work with young people with additional needs. And I think this is all very relevant in this episode, where I'm talking to Sarah from Sunflower Bakery in Maryland. She talks about funding and the need for self-funding and not to be over-reliant on charity donations. She also talks about the importance of community and people in the local community supporting enterprises and there's actually some really high value stuff at the end of this I think because she gives her top tips or the what they've learned at Sunflower and I think it's worth listening just for those top tips because if you are a bit like me and thinking well actually the time is right to start something then these tips are really really useful anyway enough from me let's hear from Sarah Today I'm talking to Sarah Portman-Milner, who's a co-founder of Sunflower Bakery, which is based in Rockville in the USA. Welcome, Sarah. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Can you, first of all, tell me a little bit about yourself and then also about Sunflower Bakery and how it all got started? I am a professional social worker by training and also I'm the sibling of a 57-year-old man with Down syndrome. I historically have worked in the inclusion of individuals with disabilities my whole life and Sunflower Bakery was an outgrowth of my passion to give as many opportunities as possible for individuals with disabilities to find meaningful employment. Our nonprofit Sunflower Bakery and Cafe Sunflower are dedicated to providing skilled job training and employment for adults 18 plus in pastry arts, production baking, barista service, and front of house operations. And in 2008, six women, some were professionals in the disability field, moms, interested community members got together to discuss the lack of opportunities for meaningful skilled employment. When we first began to organize, we were keenly aware that federal law in the U.S. required inclusion in public schools, but after graduation, then what became of the individuals who are on the autism spectrum, had severe learning differences, communication difficulties, or significant attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? What happened then? And we felt that baking would be a great match for skilled employment for a lot of folks with cognitive disabilities who require structure, repetition, and learning by showing and doing rather than by reading and researching. We met with officials from our local Montgomery County government in the state of Maryland. We also met with private and public disability professionals, sports service agencies, group home agencies, and advocacy groups to see if they would buy in for referral and collaboration. We've had phenomenal community support, I must say, and I I think part of that was because we laid our groundwork. We even had some market research done. We knew we wanted to operate as a not-for-profit entity, and we were also very aware that we needed to have an income stream as a base in order to attract donors, foundations, and government funding sources to remain viable. In 2009, we boldly started Sunflower Bakery by four of us contributing $500 each to hire a very part-time professional baker and to buy some basic supplies. A generous individual donated money for a sturdy electric mixer. We convinced an area congregation to allow us free use of their kitchen space for three hours, two afternoons a week. And we began a small pilot program offering free training to a few adults with a variety of learning disabilities to see if the concept would even work. The concept did work, and within six months, we outgrew the space and time allotted, received our first grant from a private foundation, and moved to a least 1,200 square foot space 
with a full production kitchen. In 2010, Sunflower Bakery's pastry art training formally accepted its first students, providing a curriculum that covered baking basics, employee development training, and serve safe safety and sanitation training. Early on, we realized that skilled training in a bakery was not a good match for everyone with cognitive disabilities because the job requirements of employers included concentrated focus on tasks, speed, consistency and quality, multitasking, and physical strength and stamina. If a student couldn't independently follow many stepped instructions independently or were not able to lift heavy bags of flour and sugar or very large mixing bowls filled with batter, opportunities were more limited. Yet, many individuals were highly motivated to work with baked goods. As a result, Cafe Sunflower was created in 2014. Some of the students who struggle with staying focused on tasks because they were very chatty in the bakery's kitchen were perfect candidates for welcoming customers and providing customer service in Cafe Sunflower, which was located in a busy office building. For Cafe Sunflower, we developed a new Cafe Employment Training Program that also addresses the unique learning needs of each of the individual students, while at the same time providing the opportunity to work with the community, serving baked goods, learning a set of transferable skills for future employment. Training at the cafe includes customer service and front of house operations, as well as employee development and serve safe safety and sanitation training. Since 2010, we've grown many fold. As of this spring, we will have graduated more than 100 trained, skilled students, 80% of whom have found employment within the first six months after graduation. Just a few months ago, we moved the pastry arts training program from the original 1,200 foot location to another site that is 5,700 square feet, boasts a fully equipped training kitchen, and has a very large full production kitchen. There are offices, a break room, a classroom, a computer-equipped employee development center, and the Sunflower Bake Shop retail area. This is huge for us. What a change. The current budget, which started with $2,000 from four checks of $500, the bakery budget now is $1.3 million. Critical to both of Sunflower's training programs from inception has been the concept of inclusion. While students have been trained in smaller environments, they've always been inclusive. The goal is to provide the students with the transferable skills they need to move on to competitive employment elsewhere using some or all of the skills learned at Sunflower. Each student takes from their training what they can, developing their own skills and being employed in a variety of jobs in the food industry. They pick what works for them best. Students in the pastry arts training program participate in three phases of a six-month training. During phase one, usually nine to 10 weeks, they focus on basics from identifying ingredients to preparing a wide range of pastries. The second phase of training is for eight weeks, and it builds on each student's individual strength. We expand it so that they can do multiple batches of recipes, and they learn to work more efficiently and independently, all the while internalizing a sense of urgency. That is not easily done. Most folks come to us and don't have any concept of a sense of urgency, but through time and practice, that is gradually developed. During phase two, the students begin the employee development classes. During phase three, students are hired as paid interns. Now they're part of the production team. This phase, which is also eight weeks, is considered a really important transitional phase before employment. Students are responsible for their production assignments from beginning to end, finishing their work on time or staying late to do so, using the time clock and working alongside other chefs independent. That's a key. They also continue preparation for employment by developing resumes, having practice interviews, and working together with staff on job searches. We help them make matches and understand their strengths. We have many relationships with employers. If a person has a skill set that matches what we know a certain employer requires, we will recommend that. When it comes to the actual job placement, other service providers in the community have that as their job. Within the first six months, 80% of our students are employed. Do they always stay in their first job? No. Do people who graduate from fine universities stick with their jobs after six months? Not necessarily. So just like anybody else, they've got transferable skills, and they can take them elsewhere to another place that they might feel is a better fit. But everybody has to start somewhere. So we make sure they get started in the right direction. The CAFE Employment Training Program provides three months of training. At the end of their three months, if a student is able to work with minimal supervision, he or she's employed at the cafe for six months. And they learn a lot about what it's like to be employed 
a first job. They get all of that out of the way with us before they move on to their next job. They, again, also have time because three months is nothing. They have time to get a feel for what areas they prefer, where are their strengths, where are their weaknesses. So after those six months, they move on to other employment, but they have the transferable skills, the knowledge and tools they need. Can I just ask a question there? Do you think that's an issue that often these sorts of enterprises start up and all the great intentions in the world, but they're actually not helping in in the long term because they're not providing those skills that then put you into the workplace? It seems to me, listening to you talk about your program, that what's key is that people move on, that you're training them for going forward. And as you said, they may not stay in the same job forever, but they have got skills to get them a job and move forward with their life. What's hard for me to understand why any of those places wouldn't take their very first person that they train and be thinking, what is this person doing five years from now? And that is what we ask every applicant. Where do you see yourself five years from now? We have people who can't even see themselves tomorrow and we're asking them. So we build it up for them. We provide clues and and beginnings and what if to help them understand that they may or may not stay in any job. Again, we are really realistic about understanding that people do not have necessarily the concept of time. But we think it's important to just have that introduced. So any business that trains people and hires them to work for them should have in their own employee development training, what's next for you? One of the very first things we we have them set their own goals. We help them understand how to set a goal or even have a clue how you do that or what that is. We talk to them about things that they like and they want to do and kind of get them, what do you see yourself doing? And a first job or a training program gives you an opportunity to dine at a smorgasbord, but then you only eat those things you really like. You don't go back and eat Brussels sprouts if you don't like them. So it's important for, I think, any business or social enterprise that's starting this needs to think what next. What are some of the challenges that the organizations face? As a nonprofit, generated income from sales and program fees, as well as fundraising, have always been challenging. Income from sales of baked goods and program fees represent 50% of our budget of revenue. So each year we have to raise $600,000 from donors, foundations, and other sources. We receive no ongoing support from the government. We get 10% in private and agency purchase program fees, and 40% are our sales. And the 40% really helps when you go to a foundation that is more often used to dealing with people who provide services where the income is, there is no revenue stream. There is no other option. And so they really like the fact that we understand that they're not going to give us something on the silver platter, that we have to earn it. Not to mention it's part of making our sons known and educating the community that we have sales, that we love that people come the first time for the concept and for the values and for our mission. We really need it to be so great that they come back for the wonderful products and they don't see us as a charity program, that they see us chefs and our students as capable, competent professionals who are giving them something they really want and need and they're going to come back. A lot of time is put into fundraiser. We wish that we could use more of that time to focus our energies on and our resources on training. That's an issue for us, balancing who we are. The training has to be balanced with production and training always comes first, but we have to produce enough sales to meet our 40% mark, yet we have to do fundraising to be able to supplement because you don't find other bakeries where, or even culinary schools where an individual student or two students are worked with by a professional and that's how our students learn by one to two to three ratio with a professional chef it makes all the difference in the world we have found as a challenge that fits right along with that finding staff who either have experience or motivated to have a steep learning curve we've learned that staff members need to have not just an area of expertise but they also need to internalize our mission into their everyday work and a key to that is having heart which is really hard to articulate as an essential job function on a job description. You have to not just get references on people, but you really have to get a feel for them. And certainly for the chefs and the instructors and the administrators, that is key. 
employment for training with a wide variety of learning differences is a challenge in and of itself. We've always wanted to be able to train the widest range of folks for employment so that they can have more opportunities. As a result, we started the cafe for folks who are not a match for pastry arts, and we're currently developing a packing and shipping track for our other individuals who may find success with skills developed in that area. People order everything online these days, and we've had requests for products to be shipped around the country and around the world, and the new program will meet many needs. Our experience with COVID-19 has really reinforced our understanding of the needs to fill jobs in so many businesses that are now shipping and delivering products beyond what was ever done in the past. We had already started working on it before. Who knew we would be dealing with the kind of life we're dealing with now under COVID-19, but it has reinforced our motivation and our feeling that this is going to be an area that is going to be really so needed What are some of the plans that you have for the future for Sunflower Bakery? Our plan is to make our program easily replicable to the many individuals, organizations, and institutions that have contacted and visited us over the years. We want to provide consultation, curriculum, webinars, and help people set up such an entity. That way, many, many more opportunities can be made available for individuals with learning differences to get SEAL training or employment in other locations far and wide. And it's not magic. It's not a trick. There's no secret to it. It's hard work. We actually have some top tips for people. If they're thinking about doing this, I joke and I always say, the first thing is you have to look at yourself and the people who you're developing as a team. What is your level of masochism? Because you have to know it's not easy. You have to be ready to do the hard work. That said, we have learned some things to make it a little easier for you. You should start with a relationship with an established agency, organization, or funder who will handle that part the financial part. Start with a partnership. We started with none of the above, and we really advise others to get that in place first because then you can focus on the people part. Start small. Start small, but start. Don't start big. Don't aim for something huge immediately. Start small and doable, but get started. Recruit an active and committed board. Choose carefully and try to find targeted representation. For example, you need a lawyer, a banker. Find somebody in the food industry, business person who always talks to you, what's your business plan? What's the bottom line? See if you can get an accountant, educator or educators, individuals with disabilities. And also you want to have professionals working with people and the disability issues in the larger community. We found that you should not hesitate to reach out to the community for assistance or help. We have found people are so willing to help. We have more people offering volunteered services than we can use. And in fact, that's something to be very careful about. Initially, for several years, we had the only paid employee was the professional chef. The rest of us didn't get paid and we had volunteers. And we found that as we did start paying people, we needed to use less volunteers because they wanted to do the tasks that we were teaching students to do. And we could not do both. We needed to make sure that always that the training of the students were the priority. So we developed other kinds of volunteer programs, had other opportunities when we knew we needed extra hands with packing and shipping orders for holidays. We call on those people. We called on some of the volunteers who were in full-time jobs to provide practice interviews with our students. We had other people who were in the food industry give pointers to our students and help them with their resumes so that they would be able to emphasize their strengths and their value to any employer. Last tip, don't hesitate, start. Do research, contact key players in the communities. If you don't take the first step, you will never reach your goal. Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're most welcome. Key takeaway, well, to quote a well-known advertising slogan, just do it, I think is really what I've taken away from this one. As always, if you could leave a podcast review, that would be great. And if you have any recommendations for guests, or for topics you want me to talk more about, then you can message me on Instagram or Facebook at Deborah Caldo, or you can email podcast at expandingworlds.com.